Well, good morning and happy Easter to you. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That indeed is our response this morning. We have the greatest news that this world has ever known, and we get to celebrate that this morning, that Jesus has died and paid for our sins at the cross, but he did not stay dead. He is alive. And so thank you for joining us this morning. Yeah, absolutely. No, seriously, thank you for joining us this morning. If this is your first time with us, my name is Brandon, and I'd like to just say welcome to you. Uh, the fact that you've carved out some time to be with us this morning, if you just kind of came alone or if you came with some folks, uh, really does mean a lot. And so we hope that you received a, uh, just a token of appreciation when you walked in here. If you didn't, uh, we've got some, some bags and some folks that will be back at the Next Steps area on your way out. And so uh, what we're going to do this morning is you're just going to see... Uh, a lot of people in here who know their need for Jesus and know that he has met their greatest need at the cross. And so we're going to worship the Lord this morning through our singing and through our sitting and our listening and our responding and all of it. And we are glad that you're here this morning. Well, would you go ahead and stand up with me this morning? We start our gathering out every single week in the same way. And you, you would, some would say, man, that, isn't that boring? No, it's not. We want to hear the Word of God because we want to be reminded that it is God who initiates this. He is the one who invites us to worship Him. And so His Word says this in Romans 6, 9, and 10, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For He died, uh, for the death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And so this morning, it is true that Jesus is risen. And because he is risen, everything has changed. God's wrath against sin has been atoned for. Judgment and the curse are not our future anymore. Death itself has been defeated. And so let that cause our hearts to just well up with praise this morning. And may we sing and tell of the goodness of our great God. Sing, I was buried beneath my shame. Who can carry that kind? Oh, wait, that's where we were headed. It was my tomb. Till I met. Soon I was breathing, but not alive. And all my failures I tried. Sing it out, you call my name. You call my name. And I ran out of that grave.
Christian, this is our song. I needed a rescue. I needed a rescue. My sin was saving. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. But you called me a citizen of hell. Come on, sing it out. When I was broken, you were my song together this morning and so we'll start out by singing the chorus we'll sing it for you one time join us the second time and then we'll jump in from the top but it goes like this let there be dancing in the darkness and let our song break through the night lift your voice and sing that Christ is King for Jesus is alive let there be Let's sing it again.
Jesus is one, hallelujah. We overcome oh, in Jesus, oh, in Jesus. Good morning, church family. It's good to see you. Happy Easter. And uh, what a day of celebration and opportunity as we come to uh, this part of our service where we get to celebrate baptism and those coming to accept Christ and saying before you in the testimony of baptism that they have stepped from death to life in Christ Jesus. And if you're a guest or uh, you're like, man, there's, what, what's this baptism thing about? I, I, Give me just a second just to tell you this there's nothing special about this water city water but it, it sits before you today in this pool as a demonstration of God's love that was placed on Calvary for us and completed in the resurrection and that is the symbol that when someone goes down into the water is to signify that they have died to their old life they've died to sin and they are raised to walk anew in Christ, free from sin, with the identity of Christ, heaven as their eternity, but also as a testimony to you of this change and that now their life is in Christ and that you may also encourage and support them as believers and expect them and look to them to be growing in Christ. And so today we have two baptisms in this service and excited to introduce you to Kerrigan Pinion. Kerrigan uh, and her family have been part of our church for many years, and uh, so she has had the opportunity to grow up in church, hear the gospel many times. Her family has shared the gospel with her, and as she's grown now to 12 years old, get that right? Good. That's an important detail. The, uh, over about a year and a half ago, as she told me this when she started to question and, and hear and ask the questions to her mom on the way to softball games, different things, and her family, and go, what does it mean to know Christ? What does it look like to walk with Jesus? And as those questions got answered, and then she aged into our student program and began to ask more questions, and then to seek the Word, reading the Bible, then ask her small group leaders. And then over that time came to the place of going, I want to spend eternity with Jesus. I'm convicted of my sin, and I understand that in order for that to happen, I must confess that Jesus is Lord and surrender my life. And so she did that several months ago, and today comes before you as that testimony. And so this morning, Kerrigan, it's my privilege to ask, have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Yes. Then based on your public profession of faith, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Now we have Layla Rollins. Come on down. Layla's been attending our church for many years also with her family. And uh, Layla's journey of coming to Jesus today before you um, is no different than anyone else's, she would tell you. It's got a little bit more to it sometimes for someone that's 16 years old. Growing up in church, Layla's heard the gospel. Have you kept count at this point? No, it's a lot. We'll go with a lot. All right. And she came to a place, I don't know, we're going to say that was about 12 years old, that Layla began to question not only her faith, but just question the reality of God. A lot of rebellion. She told me entered her heart. And in order to cope with rebellion and cope with the sin, she tried to cope with more sin. Anybody else feel that guilt sometimes? And so the sin, as it does, it led to more guilt and led to more what I think you even said to me is darkness. Even as a sophomore, walking through periods, as a sophomore in high school dealing with chemical addictions, dealing with mental health, not even being able to think clearly, and realizing for her own health she had to get out of those things. And it was as her mind was cleared and she realized for her own personal health she had to get help, that as God was clearing her mind, he was also giving her a sensitivity to hear the gospel again. And she started asking questions. Well, if this is real, then how, how can I deny it? And so she went on the quest of even seeking to understand, is God who he says he is? Reading the scriptures, talking with her parents, asking questions. And she, as she was telling me, she said, I came pretty much to the point that I couldn't deny it anymore. I'd run out of questions. And he had affirmed them. And I hadn't, there was nothing left. The God that I had been running and from and rebelling was still graciously in front of me. And the most gracious thing I could do was surrender to him. And I celebrate this. This young lady, for probably many of you in this room, has been prayed over. And if you've spent any time having conversations with her, even in the recent weeks, you would know there is a transformation here. The gospel has come to life. And we rejoice today with her baptism. And so, Layla, it's my privilege to ask you, have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Yes. Then based on that public profession of faith, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we continue celebrating this morning, go ahead and let's stand back up as we get to celebrate by singing now to our great God. Change. 
pray with me this morning. Jesus, we're thankful that you are alive. We know that your word says that had Christ not raised from the dead, what we're doing right now would be foolish, utter foolishness. But because he has, because we believe that, Lord, we're thankful that we have, if we are in Christ, a hope that is secured. And so continue, Lord, just this morning to fix our eyes on Jesus, to show us more of who you are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm George Mitchell. I've been a member of West Cabarrus Church since 2010. And as a very young kid, I developed some severe anxiety disorders. This led to a pretty, pretty serious stutter uh, all the way up until about 10th grade. So my biggest fear was when I went to elementary school and had to get up in front of the class and speak for the first time, I couldn't do it. These kind of anxiety issues throughout my life led to substance abuse as I felt like I was always looking for something uh, to give me some type of comfort. I will say that the first time I know that God showed up in my life, really showed up, was a local 20-year-old guy named Ronnie Vish brought my brother a brand new snare drum and a pair of drumsticks. And he came to our house and he told my brother, here, give this to your brother. I tried playing them. I really don't want to play the drums. But for me, that was God giving me a tool to cope with my anxiety. My playing the drums for hours is no different than someone waking up in the morning and going on a five mile run. So as a young man, I've always felt unsettled, always. Meaning, I felt like I was in a worldly race, always, with everything. And, and I was like, I felt like, man, if I get to that finish line, I could finally relax. And I don't know what that is, but that's how I used to live my life. I was 47 years old when I came to know Christ. In 2009, I had just met my future wife, Sherry. And she had given her life to Christ recently. For our first date, she asked me would I go to an Easter play with her. So I thought it was her youngest daughter's Sunday school play. And I said, sure, I'll go. You know, I thought it would be fun. Well, it ended up being this um, professional, full production Easter play. Jesus is carrying this massive cross up the middle aisle and I'm sitting there in the aisle and I'm watching this it was about unbearable I almost couldn't watch it the guards were following him and whipping him and they had these hammers and spikes and then the lights went out all you could hear for about a minute or two was really long was just the banging of those spikes of course I broke down and I feel like that that's the moment the Holy Spirit came into my body. I had so much empathy for Christ and I felt so guilty in my own life like I, that I had strayed so far. And here's the thing, I knew this story very well, but I feel like I knew who Christ was, but I never had a relationship with him. That's really what it comes down to. You know, I knew the book, I knew the story. I didn't know who he was. But I just got the sense in my soul that this was the way. You know, I had tried everything else. It didn't work. And here I was when I turned 49 as an adult and someone who accepted Christ as his Savior. I wanted to profess that again as an adult. And I got baptized in this room at 49 years old. And my life has changed forever. Well, amen, amen. Happy Easter to you, church family. It's great to see you here today as we celebrate the resurrected Christ. That's what it's all about. That's what Easter is about. And let me just say, if you are a guest here, and maybe the church thing isn't um, the normal thing that you do, we're really glad that you're here. Uh, we've prayed for you. I hope this place feels like home. I hope that you're encouraged, that all of us together are challenged and uh, changed. What George says right there at the end of, of his testimony there was that, and my life was changed forever. 
And that really is what Resurrection Sunday is about. That really is what the resurrection tells us. It is a true historical event, absolutely, but it's more than that. It, it is words that are written on a page for us to read and understand, but it is certainly much, much more than that. It is a life-changing power. And so thankful to have George share his story and to hear those from our um, baptistry this morning. But we're going to see that in the Bible today as well. We're going to see it in a man named James, the life-changing power of the resurrection. So if you, have a, if you have a copy of God's Word, and I hope that you do, go ahead and make your way to James. We're going to spend just a little bit of time there at the beginning of James. And if, uh, if you're really good uh, with your Bible, you can kind of put your finger also in 1 Corinthians 15. We will get to that passage here in just a little bit. And let me just say, again, if you uh, aren't familiar with the Bible uh, and you don't have one, we have one in our Welcome Center. We'd love to give you as a gift. And the Bible is, is one grand story. And as you turn the pages of the Bible, you see it made up of 66 books with the ultimate goal of redemption history. So it is an amazing book, well worth your time to read. And so we'd love to give you that as a gift today if you don't already have one. So James 1.1. 1, 1. We're just going to read actually the first half of this verse. We've been going through the series on James, and I told you when we started it, and we'd come back and look at the first part of verse 1, which we're going to get to do today. So the person that's writing this book's name is James, and he says this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, we pray now. That as we read from your word, that you would cause our hearts to be curious about what it is that we read. That you would cause us to find it fiercely interesting. Lord, would you give us the eyes to see the truth and to believe it today. Lord, would you give us hearts that are, that are ready to receive the hope that you're offering us. Lord, would you awake our attention in order that our souls would be awakened. Now, for everyone in the room, I want to give you just a moment right now to pray and ask that God would speak to you. No matter where you are in your walk of faith, whether you're really far from God or you feel extremely near to God, or maybe you don't even believe in God, would you be so bold to pray and ask that he would speak to you in this moment of silence right now? Let's pray and ask God to speak. Lord, by your grace, enlighten our minds, cleanse our hearts so that we would hear and meditate on your word rightly and then wholeheartedly embrace and be obedient to it. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, the first thing I want us to grasp from this tiny little verse that I read to us is the life-changing power of the resurrection. The life-changing power of the resurrection. Now, as I read that verse, you, you might be thinking, huh? Where, where do you see that, Ryan? Like, where do you see that in those, those few words that you read to us? Well, let's walk through it and then bring a few other passages throughout Scripture. And I think in context and in clarity, we'll see the life-changing power of the resurrection. See, James, the author of this book, was the, the half-brother of Jesus. He shows up in the Bible uh, first, in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 3. Now, Mark chapter 3 is early on in Jesus' ministry. And Jesus has been healing people, doing these amazing miracles. And every miracle is meant to point you to he being the Messiah, that Jesus is the Messiah. He's been preaching and proclaiming the good news and lives are being changed. He's been forgiving people of their sins he talked about how he is the, the groom and God's people are the bride and that he would love them and care for them forever. So this is powerful stuff. And as Jesus is preaching one time, the crowd keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and there's so many people there. And into that moment of intense popularity, Jesus' family arrives. 
He's got siblings there and, and, and his mother's there. And, and the question is, how will his siblings respond to Jesus' fame growing? How will Jesus' siblings respond to his message? Are they going to move forward and, and confirm that this is the one? <laughs> that this is the Messiah? Will they walk forward as Jesus is preaching and, and bow their knee at his feet and worship and praise him? Will they stand by his side as the, the cabinet of his new administration as he brings in his kingdom? Well, this is what Mark chapter 3 tells us happens as Jesus is preaching and proclaiming and his family comes forward. Mark chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Then he went home, the crowd gathered again, so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, when they heard that his fame and his name was being proclaimed, they went out to seize Jesus, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Just when Jesus' public ministry was gathering momentum, James, the brother of Jesus, and his other siblings come to take custody of him because they thought he was crazy. They thought he was insane, right? Not only did Jesus' family think he had lost his mind, they're saying, we're not even going to give any kind of endorsement to him. We're not going to give any endorsement to his campaign. Now, the next time we see the encounter with James and Jesus is actually in the Gospel of John. John chapter 7. John chapter 7 says this, after Jesus went about in Galilee, he'd been teaching and healing and doing these miracles, he would not go about in Judea because the Jews, that's the, the religious leadership there, and they were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So, and notice this, so his brothers, this is James, so his brothers said to him, Jesus Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Which, this sounds great, right? Like, this sounds there's been like a change of heart with his brothers. That maybe they thought he was crazy at first, but now they're actually believing in him. Until you read the very next verse. Because it tells us the motive for why they're telling Jesus to go to the main stage. To go into the city and to preach the good news. And this is what John chapter 7 verse 5 tells us. This is why they said this. For not even his brothers believed in him. They are wanting him to go into the city so that they can mock him. So that they can make fun of him. They are goading him in to go into Jerusalem to speak, not as a vote of support, but they're being sarcastic. Their disbelief in their brother has hardened their hearts to disdain and mockery. Now, this is what's fascinating about that. that that's, that's where James was. And yet, we've just read a passage... That's in the Bible from this man who disdained and mocked Christ. And yet he is writing a letter to the church. You get to the book of Acts and after the resurrection has happened, it says that Christ has appeared to his uh, disciples. And then in Acts chapter 1 verse 14, it says that all, all these, the, the apostles, the disciples, with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. The resurrection is the life-changing power for James. The resurrection is what changed everything about his life. The book of Galatians will tell us that, that James was a pillar of the early church. Acts chapter 12 will tell us that that James was, was there and was, was working in the church there in Jerusalem. And by Acts 15, he's leading this, this whole kind of conference as these believers are gathering together to talk about the gospel and how to spread it across the world. 
this man James has been changed by the resurrection of Christ. And all of these other passages talk about James. All these other people mention the life of James, who he was and how he has been changed by the resurrection. But James also says it of himself. You see, James right here says he is a servant of God. James is a servant of God. The last time we hear somebody write something about James, it's from ancient historians who weren't necessarily believers. Josephus wrote about him, uh, Eusebius wrote about him, and they tell him that as he's leading the church of Jerusalem, that the, 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 the people there get frustrated that he's telling people to worship Christ and to give their all to him and to have their lives changed by Jesus. And they get so upset at this life-changing message that they take James up to the top of the temple. And they tell James, we're going to throw you off unless you confess that you don't believe in Jesus. Unless you go back to what you were doing, mocking Jesus and making fun of Jesus and disbelieving in Jesus. If you won't go there, man, then we're going to throw you off the temple. And James, according to church history, said, he told the people, I will never turn away from Christ, for he is the Son of Man who is now in heaven at the right hand of God with all mighty powers, and he will come again with the clouds of heaven. And in anger, they threw him off, and he gave his life for this message. It's the life-changing power of the resurrection. It changed him completely from the inside out to where now He's saying, I am a servant of God. Now, throughout the Bible, this term servant of God is, is not necessarily something new. We see in the Old Testament that, that Moses was called a servant of God. Daniel was called a servant of God, one of the prophets. One of the kings, David, was called a, a, a servant of God. Jeremiah was called a servant of God. But this is revolutionary to James. This marks a major shift in James's life. The once skeptic is now a servant. He identifies himself for this, and this is a shock to everybody who would have known the life of James before the resurrection. And James says, no, now I'm a servant. And his life proved that he was a servant even unto death. Even unto death. And he says... The reason why I would give my life, the reason why I'm a servant is because Jesus is the Lord and the Christ. That's what James 1 says. He says, I'm a servant of God, and then he's like, let me tell you about that God. That God is Jesus, and Jesus is the Lord, and he is the Christ. And this is what he says, and these are important terms that he attaches to Jesus, extremely important terms. See, that word for, for Lord right there, especially in the Roman world, was, was designated for the ruler of Rome. It was designated for Caesar. And they actually had a temple that you'd have to go by there and get a pinch of incense and throw it on there and say, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is the master of my life. Caesar is over all things. He is the preeminent one. He's above everything. And people who came to Christ and saw him as the Lord. And so people got mad with people like James who didn't come and burn their incense to Caesar as Lord, but said, no, Jesus is Lord. So as he writes these words down here, this is not to build his fame and his name. This is actually putting a target on his back for the Roman government to come and arrest James, which is what happened to him, because he proclaimed that Jesus is Lord. But he also says that he is the Christ. That word Christ there means anointed one. It was something they would do particularly for different leaders at that time. Somebody would be a new king or a new Caesar. They'd come in, they would take this, this oil and they would pour it over their, their shoulders or their head and anoint them, anoint them as like a little C Christ, a, a Messiah. Or they would look at priests and they would anoint them to serve people. And here... James gives the capital C to Christ. He is the anointed one who has come, yes, to rule as a king, but also to, to serve as a priest 
And he is the one who would give his life. He is the Messiah, the one that we've been longing for and waiting for. He is the Christ. Now, as we read these words, we realize that that James, the brother of Christ, saw all of Christ's life. All of it. And for you... uh, that, that grew up in the kind of 80s and 90s. I remember watching kind of like those VH1 behind the, the music where they would tell stories about kind of famous people's lives. And many times as you would watch those stories, there would be family members that would come, brothers or sisters or uh, different relatives, and say, hey, what you saw on stage, that wasn't the real person. <laughs> what you saw on stage is not who they really were. Look at the horrendous things that they did. That's normally kind of what you see. When somebody has passed, then all these things come out about Man, this is who they really were as a famous person, right? But that's not what we find from James. James, who shared a bathroom with Jesus and shared a bedroom with Jesus and lived life together, saw all of Jesus' life. As he sits here and looks at the life of Christ post-resurrection, he says, no, everything he said is true. Everything he said is real. We believe. So much so, he would say, I will submit to him as my Lord. He is the Messiah. I will be his servant. And if we're honest, we hear that. And this is a challenge to us. This isn't just a statement of declaration for James. He was a servant. No, James throughout his whole book and what we've already seen, this is a call for all of us to come and to die. For all of us would come to Christ to see Him as the Lord of our life. That He is the Messiah, that He is the the King, that we would submit everything to Him and say that I am a servant of King Jesus. If we're honest, who, who really wants to be a servant? That doesn't sound fun. It doesn't sound easy. And yet, if you know this man, if you know the God-man, Jesus Christ, it is good. It is a good thing. It is a delight to belong to Him. It's not a burden for us. No, it's a burden lifted that we would have joy. And so as we think about being a servant of King Jesus, when we look at the compassion of Jesus to go to the cross and die for our sins, To die not just for us, but in our place. He died instead of us. We look and we're like, yes, I will follow that man. I will follow Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Yes, I will do that. When we see the compassion of Christ, when we see the the power of Christ that defeats death itself and is risen from the grave, when we see the power of God, we're like, okay, If you're a king, we will listen to your commands. Because we know your commands come from a heart of compassion, but also a heart of might and power. Oh, will we look and remember the power of the resurrection that changes our hearts and our minds and gives us peace even as we look at the grave. Now, we can still look at this, and I I say the resurrection is what changed it for, for James. And it absolutely does. I read many passages in Scripture that highlight the the life change for James. Who he was beforehand, a doubter and a disdainer, to who he is now, a servant of Jesus Christ. But, But I left out one very important passage that mentions James. And this is the passage I told you to kind of put a book, uh, a bookmark on when we get to it, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to see James show up again. And if you're looking for a passage of Scripture because you don't know where to start and reading the Word, with it being Easter day, an Easter weekend, read the entirety of 1 Corinthians 15 and you will see the beauty and the depths of the resurrection. But here, we're just going to read the very beginning of it. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is writing this and he says, for I delivered to you as of first importance 
which anytime somebody's going to, in the Bible, say this is of first importance. This is something we should pay attention to. And he said, I delivered to you as first importance what I had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to, to Cephas and then to the twelve, then he appeared to, to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Now notice verse 7. Then he appeared to James. James, post-resurrection, he shows up and he talks to James. Can't imagine what that conversation looked like. And then it says this, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as one ultimately untimely born, he appeared also to me. What we find in these verses that I read right here is the reality and the reason for the resurrection. See, these are the two things that shaped and changed James' life, and these are the two things that will shape and change our lives. The reality of the resurrection and the reason for the resurrection. See, the change that James had in his life came as a response to the objective reality that he came face to face with as he saw Jesus resurrected. This was a historical event. The resurrection changed James' mind. It's because he saw the reality of it. And what Paul is doing right here as he writes is he's helping us see first the empty tomb. We have to understand the empty tomb is important. It is a historical event that happened. To prove Jesus said who he said he was, was he had to defeat the grave. He was buried and then he rose. And so Paul, as he writes this, he's like, this is important. Don't miss this. The tomb is empty. There's no one there. This is proof of the resurrection. Look to the tomb. But then he also says, look to the witnesses. You see, Jesus appeared to a lot of people. Did you notice that as I read that? It wasn't like Jesus rose from the grave and kind of hid himself and nobody saw him. And it was just like, yeah, he rose. Yeah, sure he did. No, no, no. Jesus wasn't hiding. Verse 5, he appeared to Cephas. That's the, the apostle Peter. And then he appeared to the other disciples. And then Jesus appeared to crowds of people, more than 500 men. And then he appeared to Paul and to James. Jesus was seen by many eyewitnesses. And Paul even says he appeared to me. This letter was written roughly 20 years after the, the life and death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so he says, if you question this being true, go talk to the people that saw him. He said they're still alive today. Go ask him. Go ask him about all the questions that you have. Go look and you will see people that saw Jesus. They could speak to this. They're willing to discuss the resurrection. And the early church grew rapidly because men and women fanned across the world spreading this message of a man who died and a man who rose. And these two pieces of evidence, the empty tomb and the bold confessing witnesses, provide evidence for the historical resurrection of Jesus. The historian N.T. Wright said it this way. It had to be both of these. It had to be the empty tomb and it had to be eyewitnesses. If you only had an empty tomb, people would say, well, they just stole the body then. They just kind of moved him somewhere else. Because no one had ever seen Jesus. Oh, this is just a myth. This is just a lie. Now, if you only had people saying, well, Jesus is resurrected. We, we saw him then people would say, well, this crowd was probably hallucinating. They were probably all, all 500 plus people were probably having the same hallucination, right? But no. They would just say, that's a lie, and they'd go to the tomb. The tomb wasn't empty and say, look, here's the body. Here's the corpse of Christ. All of what you're saying is not true. But the tomb was empty. Nobody denies that. Even skeptics would say, no, no, the tomb was empty. 
So why was it empty? How was it empty? And there'll be a debate over that. But, but, but having both of them, the empty tomb and eyewitnesses, are the proof that we need that the resurrection is true and it is real. It should stir in our heart a powerful reason for the emergence of belief. See, see Christianity is unique. It's unique in the fact that, that the foundation of Christianity is not just, uh, just faith. Just have faith. The foundation of Christianity is not just, just believe. That's, belief is not the foundation of Christianity. No, it is the historical events of the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is what we base our whole faith on. And Paul and the rest of 1 Corinthians 15 is going to say that. He's going to say, no, our faith is based on Jesus raising from the dead. Now, to understand the reality that Jesus rose from the grave is amazing. It's amazing. But the question that would come to our mind is, well, well, why did he even have to die? Why did he have to die and then raise in the first place? And that's why Easter is so important to our lives today. Because there's a reason that he rose. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us in verse 3, this is the most important thing. That Christ died and rose for our sins. For our sins. This is the reason that Christ went to the cross and rose from the tomb. He died for our sins. Now, what is sin? It literally is an, an archery term that they would talk about missing the mark. In a competition, if there was two guys that were shooting at the, the target and they missed the mark, it landed short, they would say sin. You've missed the mark. And we as humans have missed the mark of where God has both called us and led us to be. We have missed it. We've rebelled against Him and run in the complete opposite direction. Whether that be through our uh, worrying instead of trusting, or our complaining from our lips, or our gossip, or our lust, or our greed. All of these are running from ways that God had called us to trust Him and to follow Him. And we try, we try to fix ourselves by so many different ways. We try to fix our missing the mark through our morality. If we can just be good enough. Or we'll try to fix ourselves by just the denial of it. Just the denial of the whole thing. Or, or we'll just try to numb our conscience to the things that we're doing that we know are wrong. We, though, we still know deep in our soul, we feel the kill that's going on. And Paul says that if Christ has not been raised from the dead, that you and I are still in our sins. But the fact that he has risen from the grave, he says that Jesus was put to death for our sins, but now he is raised for our justification. And justification is a big word, but it just means justified, never sinned. See, Christ bears our sin, though he was sinless, in order for us to be justified as like we had never sinned. Not because of our works, not because of our denial, not because of us hardening our hearts to our conscience. No, it's because of the work of Jesus Christ. The wages of our sin was death, and Jesus paid that death on the cross. He has rendered everything necessary for our forgiveness. And so death does not get the final word. It doesn't. Not for the believer. No, the resurrection means that the condemnation for our sins is over. The resurrection means our sins have been paid for. Through the resurrection, Christ's stamp paid in full across all of our sins. And if you're here and you're saying, man, I, I don't know about mine. I don't know if Christ would, would forgive me of my sins. Then I would challenge you to look at the life of James. Look at him. This is a man who mocked Jesus to his very face. This is a man who denied Jesus. And we don't know exactly what that conversation was like when the resurrected Jesus appeared to James, but I feel very confident in this, that Jesus in his resurrected form did not walk up to James and shame him. How dare you, James? 
You are so wrong. Look, 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 look. I'm right here. Touch me. You're an idiot, James. I don't think that's what Jesus did. I don't. And for some of us here, we're like, I, I kind of fit in that category of James. I have mocked Jesus either with my friends or I've done it publicly. It's okay. Jesus is still there saying, come to me. I will pay your sins in full. I've already done it on the cross. If you'll just confess them and believe, he, he, he will do that for you. There are no sins that can outpace the grace of God. There's not. And so come and receive the, the life-changing grace that James received to the point where you can look and say, no, I used to mock him, and now he is my master. I used to mock him, and now I'm a missionary for Jesus. I am a servant of Christ, for there's no better way. There's no better way. Oh, would you come and look at the life of James and believe? Oh, I beg you, I plead, I pray for us that we would stand in awe and wonder of the resurrection. We believe in the reality of the resurrection. We'll stand in awe of His power. How could someone defeat the grave? Oh, we'll stand in awe of that, and we should. But when we see the reason for His resurrection, that He took our sins in our place, then we will stand in wonder at his love. Oh, may we do that today. May we stand in awe and wonder at the resurrection of Christ. Bow your heads with me. Most holy and most merciful God, you give strength to the weak and rest to the weary. You give comfort to the sorrowful. Lord, you are the Savior of the sinner. Lord, you are the refuge for your children in our ever-present need. And so, Lord, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you for what you have done. We thank you for the cross and the reason for the cross, the reality that you did go to the cross and you rose from the grave. God, we thank you for the resurrection, the resurrection that changes, not just an external change, not just a change of habit, but Lord, it changes the heart. It changes lives just like James, just like George, just like the ladies that were baptized today. It changes us. And God, we thank you for the life-changing power of the resurrection. We praise you for the invitation to come, to come and to find that life, that life anew. And the only way that we find that is we come to the cross and we kneel and we confess our sins. And what we find in response of our confession is a faithful Savior who has paid it all, who has paid it all in our place. And so, Lord, thank you that you accept us when we come to you with humble hearts. It's in your name we praise you. Amen. Church family, let's stand now. Let's continue to sing to this resurrected King. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. When striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand.
the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath but Jesus commands my destiny come on Jesus is alive and we stand in that great in-between between his first coming and his second coming when he will come again for those who have put their faith and trust in him and he will take us to be with him forever. So we have had the great opportunity, the, the great joy this morning again to hear the gospel that God has sent Jesus to pay for our sin. He lived perfectly. He died on the cross, in our place, he raised victoriously from the grave. What great news, but it demands a response. It demands a response because there truly are only two ways to live. We can receive this or we can turn our backs against this. And so as you have heard the gospel this morning, we pray if you are not in Christ that you would be in Christ, that you would surrender your all to him and walk in faith and in repentance. We've got some folks standing back at the Next Steps area that would love to talk more with you about what that means. If you were invited by someone, spend some time this afternoon over lunch or on the ride home, perhaps talking about what that means to be in Christ, to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, We do thank you again for coming this morning, especially if this is your first time with us. And so if you didn't receive a gift on the way in, please grab one at the tent or at the Next Steps area on your way out this morning. Church family, if you are a part of West Cabarrus Church, I want to remind you again this morning the great privilege that we have to worship the Lord through our giving. And so uh, you know that you can do that uh, on the app, online, or in the giving stations in the Welcome Center or the lobby this morning. But we're so glad that we have had another opportunity to celebrate the great hope that we have in Christ. And so as we go out of here today, may we go out of here with this. Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, 
May he equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And we all said together, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Happy Easter to you. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Out of the shadows, bow for the gallows.
Well, good morning and happy Easter to you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. He is risen. Ah, he is risen. So when we say he is risen, you can respond by saying he is risen indeed. So let's try that again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Believers have been doing that for centuries as they approach Easter Sunday morning, realizing that the Savior is, in fact, alive. And so that is good news. That changes absolutely everything. Uh, If this is your first time with us this morning, uh, especially thankful for you being here with us and uh, to know that you would carve out uh, this morning to be with us really does mean a lot. Hopefully you received a a little gift, a little token of our just thanks for being with us this morning. If you didn't, you can uh, grab one of those on the way out, Uh, but we are a people uh, as a church who are just madly in love with Jesus. We love what he's done for us. We remember week in and week out that we're forgetful and that we need to be reminded that Jesus has uh, in fact taken our place at the cross and that he has risen victoriously from the grave. And so we are going to just celebrate this morning in the way that we sing and uh, the way that we listen and respond and even by the way that we welcome one another. So I want to invite you to go ahead and stand up with me this morning. Go ahead and stand up. We start our gathering off like this every week, just reading the scriptures and being reminded that God initiates this. He is the one who invites us in, and he does so by his word. So hear his word now, Romans 6, verse 9. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And so because Jesus has arisen, everything has changed. God's wrath against sin has been atoned for, judgment, and the curse are not our future anymore. Even death itself has been defeated. And so hearing that, we remember that we have much, much, much to celebrate this morning. So let's do so by the way that we sing and worship to our Lord. Sing this together. I was buried beneath my shame. Oh, who can carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till that day, till I met. Oh, I was breathing, but not.
that this is our story. I needed rescue. I needed rescue. My sin was saved. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen. Sing it out when I was broken. When I was broken, you were my healing. continue to worship we're going to learn a song together so i'll sing the chorus for you and then the second time around join in doing your best and then we'll sing it all together so it goes like this let there be dancing in the darkness and let our song break through the night lift your voice and sing that christ is king for jesus is alive sing it. let there be changes everything. Now the tomb is empty and the stone is rolled away. Praise the risen one who overcame the grave. All you broken hearted, all you Hallelujah, Jesus is one, hallelujah, 
Please go ahead and have a seat as we turn our attention to the baptismal pool. Well, good morning, church family. It's good to see you. Happy Easter. And it's always a privilege when we get to come together for worship, but especially fun when we get to come together for baptisms. And if you're a guest or you're new to church or being part of seeing a baptism take place, uh, let me just take a second just to tell you this. There's nothing super fancy about uh, this baptistry pool other than uh, it's in front of the stage and it's got lights on it. But this is regular city water. There's nothing special about it. But what takes place here today in front of you is a testimony and a symbol of the work that God has been doing. You see, when someone goes to get baptized, it's not the baptism that saves them. The salvation has already taken place, but it is the picture of them dying to themselves when they lower themselves into the water and when they're raised, showing that new life in Christ, that they are no longer their own, their identity is in Jesus. And so to us as a church family, as we see this, may it serve as an encouragement to those that maybe you're searching and looking that this would be the testimony of going, this is someone that has surrendered their life to Christ and uh, may God go with them, but also may he reveal himself to me. This morning we had the privilege to baptize Ayana Harrell. Uh, Ayana and her family have been part of West Cabarrus off and on for about 15 years. And uh, during the COVID season there, just before COVID, her family had kind of stepped back from church for a little bit. And it was back earlier before Christmas this past year and it was Ayana that was encouraging her mom and dad, saying, I don't know why, but I feel like we need to get back in church. I really want to be there. I want to, I want to be a part. I want to be part of worship. And if you noticed, even the first part of the service, she was playing saxophone over there for the first song this morning. But it was through that and coming to church that the gospel, she started to hear the gospel preach. She started to learn more and more of who Jesus was, as her mom was even sharing that, she desired to get in her Bible and go, I, I want to know who, more of this, who this Jesus is, and reading and understanding the truth. And as she did, in hearing the gospel over and over, she came to the place of surrender and saying, God, you're true, you're real, and my life belongs to you. And she repented and confessed Christ. And today comes to make that profession of faith public and to testify before each of us that Jesus is alive and he dwells within her as well. And so this morning, Ayana, it's my privilege to ask you, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Then based on your public profession of faith, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, and praise be to God. He is the God who brings us 
from darkness and into light. And so as we continue to think on that, go ahead and stand back up together as we thank our Lord Jesus for what he has done for us at Calvary.
at the cross you were buried but Jesus you were raised again and you are alive and we await your return and so Jesus because this has happened this changes everything everything the reason we live the reason we gather together this morning it changes all of it so Lord help us not to lose sight of that as we sit under your word and as we continue worshiping you in Jesus name we pray Hi, I'm George Mitchell. I've been a member of West Cabarrus Church since 2010. And as a very young kid, I developed some severe anxiety disorders. This led to a pretty, pretty serious stutter uh, all the way up until about 10th grade. So my biggest fear was when I went to elementary school and had to get up in front of the class and speak for the first time, I couldn't do it. These kind of anxiety issues throughout my life led to substance abuse as I felt like I was always looking for something uh, to give me some type of comfort. I will say that the first time I know that God showed up in my life, really showed up, was a local 20-year-old guy named Ronnie Vish brought my brother a brand new snare drum and a pair of drumsticks. And he came to our house and he told my brother, here, give this to your brother. I tried playing them. I really don't want to play the drums. But for me, that was God giving me a tool to cope with my anxiety. My playing the drums for hours is no different than someone waking up in the morning and going on a five mile run. So as a young man, I've always felt unsettled, always. Meaning, I felt like I was in a worldly race, always, with everything. And, and I was like, I felt like, man, if I get to that finish line, I could finally relax. And I don't know what that is, but that's how I used to live my life. I was 47 years old when I came to know Christ. In 2009, I had just met my future wife, Sherry. And she had given her life to Christ recently. For our first date, she asked me would I go to an Easter play with her. So I thought it was her youngest daughter's Sunday school play. And I said, sure, I'll go. You know, I thought it would be fun. Well, it ended up being this um, professional, full production Easter play. Jesus is carrying this massive cross up the middle aisle and I'm sitting there in the aisle and I'm watching this. It was about unbearable. I almost couldn't watch it. The guards were following him and whipping him and they had these hammers and spikes. And then the lights went out. All you could hear for about a minute or two was really long with just the banging of those spikes. Of course I broke down and I feel like that that's the moment the Holy Spirit came into my body. I had so much empathy for Christ and I felt so guilty in my own life like I, that I had strayed so far. And here's the thing, I knew this story very well, but I feel like I knew who Christ was, but I never had a relationship with him. That's really what it comes down to. You know, I knew the book, I knew the story. I didn't know who he was. But I just got the sense in my soul that this was the way. You know, I had tried everything else, it didn't work. And here I was when I turned 49 as an adult and someone who accepted Christ as his savior. I wanted to profess that again as an adult. And I got baptized in this room at 49 years old and my life has changed forever.
Well, amen, amen. Great to see you here on Easter Sunday, and happy Easter to everybody here. We're grateful for that. Uh, this is what we're all about, seeing life change happen, and that's ultimately what Easter is about. And so if you are kind of new to church, and church just isn't the normal thing that you do, we are glad that you're here. We really are. Uh, prayed for you this morning. Pray for all of us as a whole that we'd be comforted and challenged and convicted through God's Word today. And so you're going to need a copy of God's Word. If you don't already have one, we do have some in the Welcome Center that we'd love to give you as a gift from us as a church. And we're going to be in the book of James. James. Now, once again, if you're familiar with the Bible, you could probably find James pretty quick. But if you're new to it, James is kind of the last part, the far right of the Bible. We'll be in James chapter 1. That's the large number. And then verse 1 is the kind of small number that you'll find in that passage. And we're actually going to be in two passages today. So if you're really good, you can kind of place your finger here, or bookmark, and we'll get to 1 Corinthians 15 before our time ends today. But that video that you saw from George right there really sums up well what we're here to celebrate, that Christ, through his death and his resurrection, changes our life. He finished this video by saying, and my life was changed forever, forever. And that is what Easter is about. The resurrection of Christ is far more than just a historical event, although it was an historical event. It's far more than just words on a page, though they are words on a page. It is a life-changing event if we see, understand, and believe the reality of this. And so that's what we're going to unpack today. We're going to start here in James chapter 1. I'm just going to read one verse to you, and then we'll spend some time unpacking it before we go to 1 Corinthians 15. This is what the word of the Lord says in James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Jesus, we pray now as we think about your word. And we ask that you would cause our hearts this morning to be curious about what it is we read. Lord, would you cause us to to have a fiercely interesting thought about these truths. Lord, give us eyes to see the truth and to believe the truth. Give us hearts that are ready to receive the hope that you offer us today. And Lord, would you awaken our attention in order to awaken our souls. Now I want to give you a moment to pray right now and ask that God would speak to you. No matter where you are, in your faith walk, whether you would say, I'm really far away from God, or I feel near to God, or I don't even believe in God, would you be so bold as to take this, this moment of silence and pray and ask God to speak to you? Would you do that right now? Lord Jesus, by your grace, would you enlighten our minds and cleanse our hearts so that we would hear your word rightly and that we would rightly apply it to our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, the first thing I want us to grasp from this really short verse that I just read to you is the life-changing power of the resurrection. The life-changing power of the resurrection. Now, you might be sitting here, Ryan, you just read a few words. Like, I don't see any, like, life-changing power that you're talking about in these few words that you read to us here at the beginning of James. Well, I told you when we started this book of James, we were, you know, been going in it for several weeks, that we were going to come back to this. And so you have a little bit of context of what James has already been writing if you've been here. But if you haven't, I said we were coming back to this because this is important. How James describes himself at the very beginning is so important. Because we know that that James was the the half-brother of Jesus Christ. This is the brother of Christ. And you can go through the pages of the New Testament and hear kind of James or the siblings of Christ brought up place after place. And it doesn't match what we find here in James chapter 1. Why? Because there's a life-changing experience that happened to James where his life was changed forever. You see... You, get to, you see James kind of the very beginning of Mark chapter 3. Now, 
Mark chapter 3, you find Jesus starting his ministry, and all these amazing things are happening. Jesus is, is healing people, and he's working these miracles, and he's telling people and encouraging people that here's the good news, that the Christ has come. So as he's doing these miraculous works, and as he's speaking the grace and the truth of the gospel, lives are being changed. Crowds are, are gathering together to hear what Jesus is speaking and to see what Jesus is doing. Now, into this, this intense moment of popularity, Jesus' family arrives. And we see the siblings are there. And the question is, what, what is his family going to say? What are the, the siblings of Christ going to say about him? Are they going to come in and say to the crowd, listen to what this man has to say. He is an amazing prophet. He's an amazing teacher and preacher, and you've seen his miracles. Listen to what he has to say. Are they going to come in and, and bow at the feet of Jesus in front of this crowd and, and worship him as Lord? Is that what his family is, is going to do? Are they going to come and stand beside Jesus in front of this massive crowd as a kind of a picture of the cabinet of his new administration as his kingdom arrives? Well, look what Mark chapter 3 tells us happens in verses 20 and 21. And then he went home, and the crowds gathered again. So this is Jesus going home, and all these crowds are gathering to listen to what he said. So they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, his family, his brothers, right, James, when they heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he's out of his mind. The first time we see James mentioned in the Bible, he's calling Jesus crazy and insane. When Jesus' ministry is, is beginning and gaining momentum, James and his brothers come to take custody of him because they say he's crazy. Not even Jesus' family think he is who he says he is. They're not giving a glowing endorsement of his campaign, right? And the next encounter we see with James is in John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, tells us this. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. That's kind of like the suburbs of the major cities that are there. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews, that's the religious leaders at that time, they were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So, notice it, so his brothers, James again here, said to him, leave here and go to Judea. That your disciples may also see the works that you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Which, which sounds great, right? It's like, okay, maybe James is on board now. Maybe his, his brothers are actually believing in who Jesus said he is and who Jesus has shown that he is. <laughs> but sadly, the very next verse shows us the motive of his brother's heart. It says, For not even his brothers believed in him. Their goading him to appear in Jerusalem was not a vote of support. They were being sarcastic. Their disbelief and their brother had hardened their heart to disdain and mockery. And yet, we find as we continue to read in the Bible that, that something happened in James' life. And it's the resurrection. The resurrection is what changed James' life forever. And so you get to the, the book of Acts after Jesus has risen from the grave. And it tells us this in verse 14. They were all there. The apostles were there. And they were with one mind and they were continually devoting themselves into prayer along with the women and Mary, his mother, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers to prayer and, and worshiping the Lord. Wait a second, what happened? The resurrection happened. That's what changed everything for James. You go a little bit further in, in the book of Galatians, Paul writes and calls James a pillar within the church. This man is now a pastor leading 
We see that in Acts 15, as there's a kind of a conference gathered together of the Christian leaders at that time, talking about the gospel and how they were going to share it with the nations. James is there as one of the key leaders. What? And the last time we encountered James in ancient writings are from two historians, Josephus and Eusebius. And they tell us that, that James, because of the proclamation of the gospel, and that Jesus is Lord, it made the Romans angry. It made the different religious leaders angry. And they, according to the church history, these two stories that wrote, they say that James was arrested and taken up to the temple, the top of the temple. And they said, hey, you just go back to who you were before. If you'll just deny Jesus, if you'll just forsake Jesus, hey, throw a little mockery in, you're used to it, you've already done it before, you know how to make fun of him, call him crazy. If you'll just do those things, then we'll let you go. And James' response was no. Historians tell us that, that's not, that, that he says, no, I will not turn away from Jesus. He said he is the Son of God who dwells in heaven right now, alive and reigning with all might and power, and he will come again with the clouds of heaven. And so they push him off of the temple. And that didn't kill him, so they go down there and they finish the job by stoning him to death. Life change? <laughs> Talk about life change? This man mocked, disdained, denied Jesus, and then was willing to die for Jesus. Why? Because he's seen the power of the resurrection. He had seen the hope that came through Jesus. And all these other people talk about James, but here in this passage that I read, James talks about himself. And he doesn't come with this uh, elaborate word of like, I know Jesus' favorite color. We grew up together. I know his favorite food. No, like he starts and he says, James, a servant of God. This is how James chooses to describe himself a skeptic that's become a servant it's not just that James was a skeptic that became a believer no now he's describing himself as a servant of God and this term servant of God was not revolutionary that was used several other places in the Bible you see it mentioned of Moses in Deuteronomy Daniel is called a a servant of God. King David was also mentioned in the Bible as a servant of God. The prophet Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all these people are called servants of God. But James is revolutionary because he does something different. James makes a shift because he talks about who this God is whom he serves. And he doesn't leave it as some kind of mystical God somewhere out there. No, he brings it low. And he points to Jesus. And he says, I am a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. His self-identifier would be a shock to everyone who knew James beforehand. He is now a servant. And James didn't try to follow Christ because of the material gain that he would have or the blessing he had in his world. No, it cost him his very life. And he says, yeah, I'm a servant. What God calls me to do, that's what I'll do. Do you know how countercultural this is? How, how different this is from most stories? I mean, kind of bringing it to, to modern day, I'm thinking about this, like, growing up as an 80s, 90s kid, you know, you'd watch VH1. There used to be a channel that actually showed music, right, that you'd listen to. And they had the, the series, like, behind the, the, what was it, behind the, the music yeah, behind the music. Somebody's with me on that. Yes, yeah, awesome. Somebody watched it. Yeah, behind the music, and they would t tell you like a backstory. Well, on some of these, they would kind of bring uh, family in. And the family would be like, well, let me tell you, this isn't really who they are. Well, that's who they are on stage, but they're really not that great. Or they'd bring in like friends that after they had kind of moved on from music and their fame was gone, they'd be like, let me tell you the real story. This is who they really are. And we kind of dig up the dirt underneath it. That was kind of like the premise of what you'd kind of see in some of that show. And if anybody, anybody in the world had dirt on Jesus, it would have been James. <laughs> James would have seen Jesus throughout his life and would have been like, nope, nope, everybody's saying he's sinless? No, no, let me tell you the time he sinned. And James is like, no, everything he said came to pass. 
I heard him speaking these things. I used to think it was crazy talk. No, I saw the resurrected Christ and everything he said is true. It, it changed his life to the point where he's like, I'm a servant of that guy. He's not just my brother. No, I'm a servant of him and he is my Lord. He is the Christ. When, when James pins these words that Jesus is Lord, we read them really quickly. Maybe if you read your Bible, you skip over this and you kind of get down to the meat of the passage, right? In verse 2. But this word right here, when he wrote that Jesus was Lord, that was putting a bounty on his head. It's putting a mark on his back to be arrested. See, at that time in Rome, there was one Lord, and it was Caesar. And you were required to go and pinch incense and throw it on the altar and proclaim that Caesar is Lord. And Christians weren't doing that. They're like, no, 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 there is one Lord. There is one God. And this king, Caesar, he's not the true king. He might be a king, but he is not the king. And so we're not going to do that. Jesus is Lord. So as he proclaims this, he is, he's putting his life on the line. Why? Why would he fear death? He's already seen his, his brother defeat death. He's seen the Son of God raise forth in victory. So he's like, no, 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 he is the Lord. He's the Lord. But he doesn't just say he's Lord, he also says that he is Christ. Christ is a, is a term that was used for, for several different people at that time. Christ was somebody who was kind of set apart for a certain role. They would take kings and they would... Uh, say that this, this king is Christ, little c, and they would anoint him. And that's what Christ is. It's an anointing to say this person is ready to rule and reign. They would also do it for uh, priests. They would anoint them, because that's what you would do for a little c Christ, in order to serve the people. Now Christ comes on the scene right here, and, or Jesus comes on the scene, and he says, no, you're the real Christ. You are the king who has been called in the past and have been anointed for the day. You are the Lord of lords and the king of kings. He is the last and true Christ. And that's what he is proclaiming when he says that Jesus is the Christ. When James realized who it, his brother was, it changed everything about him. Everything. He is the, the maker of everything, yes. But what he showed here when his death and his resurrection is that he had power over sin and death. And James says, I will submit to that Lord. And I will submit to that king. I will be a servant to him. Now, yes, this is describing James, that he was a servant. But this is also a call for us. And if we come here today we hear the name Christ and we hear the hope of the cross and Jesus dying for our sins and we hear the hope of the resurrection, it's not just that, okay, great, Jesus is God. No, we need to look and say, you are Lord and we are your servant. We bow to you, we, we listen to your commands, we, we obey them, we listen to your call and we avoid certain things and we embrace certain things. What happened to James should happen to all who come to Christ. He's not just some distant God. No, he is our king that we bow our knee to and serve. Now, if we're just honest for a minute, who really wants to be a servant? Like, who rushes to sign up for that? Like, okay, yeah, I want to I be a servant. No, we want to be in charge. We want to have things done our way. We want to be the king reigning on the throne. So why in the world would I ever look to Christ and say, I'll be a servant to you? And you be my Lord. Well, it's because we're able to see what James saw. You see, when we look at the great, steadfast, faithful love of God, and what he did is he went to the cross for our sins in our place. He died not just for us, but instead of us, we will bow our knee to a love like that. 
We'll bow our knee to a love like that because he poured out his blood for us. He gave his life for us. This is a love like no other. No greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Christ did on the cross. So we'll bow our knee to that kind of love. But it's not a squishy, soft uh, kind of love, right? No, it's a love of power. And the resurrection shows that, that Jesus had power even over the worst thing, even over death, itself. And so we look at the power of Christ and we're like, yeah, I will be a servant to that. I will bow my knee to a king that has that kind of power. And that's exactly what James saw. He saw the death of Christ. He saw the resurrection of Christ. He saw the life of Christ. He's like, that's the kind of king I'll follow. That's the kind of king I'll say, I'll be a servant to him. So for us, I truly believe we see the compassion of Christ. We see the the great power of the resurrection. Then, Then bowing our knee to him saying you are my king man that's not a burden that's a joy it's not a burden that's a delight to say that's the kind of king that I want to follow now as James has his life changed as he moves from a mocker to a missionary of Jesus from a from a doubter to fully proclaiming the death and the resurrection of Christ the reason why is all around the resurrection And the reason why we know that is because of one passage I left out as I was quoting all these different passages of the brothers of Christ and James mentioned in the New Testament. There's another one that I told you we were going to look at. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, if you don't know where to start in reading your Bible and God is kind of stirring your heart that you want to kind of read and dive into his word more, then go to 1 Corinthians 15 this afternoon and just read the whole chapter. It's a great chapter for, for Easter. It's all about the resurrection. We don't have time to unpack all of it this morning. We're just going to read a few of these verses. We're going to see the name of James mentioned again. So we'll pick up in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. This is Paul the Apostle writing this letter. He says, For I deliver to you as of first importance. Now, let me just say this. If you're reading in the Bible and you see something that, that's labeled, this is of the first importance, we might want to listen up. <laughs> We might want to pause and like tune in. Okay, what is it that is so important that's labeled, not just important, but of the first importance? And he says in verse 3, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And that he was buried and was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Now look at verse 7. Then he appeared to who? To James. This is the brother of Christ. He appears to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now, there's a lot packed in these few verses. If I could break it down into two words, it's about the reality and the reason for the resurrection. I want us to see the reality and the reason for the resurrection because these two things are what convince James and I hope will convince you. The reality and the reason for the resurrection. See, the the change that happened in James' life came as a response to an objective reality that he came face to face with. This historical event where he saw face to face Jesus Christ. It's not like some mystical thing happened in James's life that was kind of out there and distant. You couldn't really touch. No, like Jesus showed up, and I wish verse 7 was like three pages long so you could see what this conversation looked like as Jesus spoke with James. But he chose to come and specifically appear to James and to talk to him. As James was faced with the reality that Jesus rose, it changed him. When he was faced with the reason for the resurrection, it changed him. Now, you see the reality of the resurrection in verse 4. It tells us that Jesus was buried and that he raised. We sum that up by just saying what he's saying in verse 4 is there was an empty tomb. There was an empty tomb that was evidence of Jesus' resurrection. There was an empty tomb that you could go to and no one was there. There's an empty tomb where Christ had once been buried. There were soldiers set outside of it, and now it was empty. 
And to prove his resurrection, it wasn't just about the empty tomb. It was also about the eyewitnesses that saw Jesus. In verses 5 through 8, it goes through like this long list of people that Jesus talked to and spoke with and, had sh- and shared meals with. Jesus appeared to a lot of people. In verse 5, it tells us that he appeared to Cephas, and that's one of the disciples. That's Peter. And then he appeared to all of the disciples, and one of them was Thomas, the doubter. And he says, hey, Thomas, you doubt so much? Then touch my body. Like, feel where the, the scars were. I'm a tangible, real, resurrected body. He appeared to crowds of people. It wasn't just like one-offs here and there where people could be confused. No, it is more than 500 people that Jesus is appearing to and talking to. And then Paul identifies himself last and says, man, he's even appeared to me. And then he, Paul, as he writes this, this is about 20 years after the, the, the death and the resurrection of Christ. And Paul's like, hey, some of these people that Jesus appeared to, like myself, come and talk to. So some of the people that were in that crowd of 500 that saw Jesus, come and talk to them. They're still alive. Some have gone to sleep, which means they have died, but some of them are still alive. So come and talk to the eyewitnesses. You want evidence in this historical moment? Then come and talk to these people that saw the resurrected Christ. Those two pieces of evidence, the empty tomb and the bold confessing eyewitnesses, prove something compelling to us of the historical resurrection of Jesus. The historian today who's alive, N.T. Wright, he talked about this, that these two things, both the empty tomb and the eyewitnesses, are so important that both of these things happen because it shows us the reality of the resurrection. He said if you, if you only had the empty tomb, then people would say, well, they just stole the body. Or they moved him uh, because, you know, no one's ever seen Jesus. So he died, and then they kind of hid him somewhere. But you had people that saw him, that he talked to, that were witnesses of it. But if you only had people saying, well, Jesus is resurrected, but there was a body in a tomb, then Rome would have just said, no, 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 come here, look at the corpse. You're saying you've seen him. No, 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 he's, he's dead. Let me, let me just prove it to you. Here it is. But... When you have the empty tomb, which nobody denies, nobody denies there was an empty tomb. Even the, the, the deepest skeptics, if you read any of their books, they will not deny there was an empty tomb on Easter Sunday. You have the empty tomb, and then you have the appearance of the living Christ to all these people. These are powerful reasons for belief. See, our faith has a foundation, and that's what makes Christianity, Christianity unique above every other religion in the world. See, Christianity is unique because the foundation of our faith is not just faith. Just, just, just have some faith out there. No. It, the foundation of our belief is not just belief. No, there are evidences that God has placed that we could go back and our faith has a firm foundation in the historical event of Jesus' resurrection. Paul is going to write later on in this chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, That if the resurrection didn't happen, like some people were saying, then we are the most to be pitied because we are stuck in our sins. No, our faith has a foundation. It is on the resurrected Christ who is alive today. Now, it's it's one thing for us to understand cognitively the reality that Jesus rose, right? That's amazing. But we have to also wrestle with the question, well, why? Why did he even die in the first place? Like we celebrate his, his resurrection, but what was the point of all of this? Why did it matter? And this is what is so important to you and I today as we celebrate this Easter. And it's the reason that he rose. The reason that he rose is what stirs our hearts, not just our minds. Verse 3, it tells us that Christ died. Why? For our sins. Christ died for our sins. What does it mean that that he that we sinned and that Christ died for our sins? That word sin, we've made it a churchy word. Originally it wasn't a churchy word, okay? Sin was a word they would use in an archery competition where a judge would stand at the bullseye and archers would stand at a difference and they at a distance and they'd shoot an arrow. And if they missed the bullseye, if they had missed their mark, 
then the judge would say, sin, sin, you've missed the mark. And then they took that word and helped us to understand what sin is for us. God had a mark for us, how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to love him and love others. And we took that and we broke that. We became self-centered. We rejected God. We loved ourselves more than him and others, and we rebelled against his commands. And God says, that is sin. You've missed the mark. And Christ, though he had never, ever missed the mark, he lived a, a sinless life and was perfect. He was put to death for our sins. Romans chapter 4 tells us that. Jesus was put to death for our sins, but he was raised for our justification. Another word, kind of churchy word, justification. That, that is a word you can think about as justified, never sinned. Christ had never sinned, and he took our sin on him as he went to the cross. So as we confess our sin and repent from our sins, he looks at us and he justifies us. He, he removes our sin away from us. He washes us white as snow, though our sins had made us like crimson. You see, the Bible tells us that the wages of our sin is death. And Jesus died on the cross. He rendered everything necessary for our forgiveness. And this is so beautiful. This is so great because now death does not get the final word for the believer. The resurrection means that condemnation for our sin is over. The resurrection means that our sins have been paid for on the cross. Through the resurrection, God stamps paid in full across all of our sins. And it's through this that he offers us the hope both in this life, but also for eternity. Now, for some of us, we think, I, I don't know if God would forgive me of my sins. I have so much shame. I don't know if God would forgive me. And if that's you, if that's what you feel today, then I would point you back to James again. I mean, it doesn't tell us in verse 7 here what, what the conversation between James and Jesus was like, but I, I feel fairly confident in saying that Jesus did not show up with, to appear to his brother James and say, come here, you idiot. Let me just tell you everything you did wrong. You mocked me? Now it's time for me to mock you, James. You made fun of me and disdained me? Great. Take a seat. Let me just make fun of you in all of your life. I don't think James got shamed by Jesus. I think when Jesus met James and radically changed his life it was because he brought grace and mercy and truth to James. And as he received that grace and mercy and truth, he realized, he realized his sins. Mocking Christ, the Lord of all creation, could be forgiven. Some of y'all can relate and say, man, I've mocked Jesus. Whether it was in the workplace or with family or friends. And Jesus says, come to me. I'll still give you forgiveness. I'll still give you hope. And that was another thing we, we looked at in the book of James. James had lost hope. He said that if you don't believe, you're, you're like a man tossed to and from in the ocean, back and forth. You have no firm foundation. And I believe James was probably writing about himself when he wrote that. He remembers what it was like to doubt Christ and to mock Christ, to disdain Christ. He was just from here to there and had no hope, had no firm foundation. And now through the resurrection, it has changed his life. He found forgiveness of all of his sins through Jesus' death and hope through his resurrection that his sins weren't stuck to James, but were taken to Christ on the cross. So Jesus is not here to shame you. He, he will convict you of sin, but it's in order that you would repent and find forgiveness and change. Now, the final application I have for this is we think about the resurrection, as we think about Easter. Let us stand in awe and wonder. Let us stand in awe and wonder. See, when we believe in the reality of the resurrection, that, he, that Jesus genuinely did rise from the grave, we will stand in awe of his power. Who has that kind of power to defeat death? No one. But I also believe that if we pause and we think about the reason for his resurrection, we won't just stand in awe. We will stand in wonder at this kind of love kind of love that would give his life, not for his sins, but for ours. And the kind of power that would go and defeat what we couldn't defeat. 
so that we could have hope and forgiveness on Easter. Bow your heads with me. Lord, you are the most holy and the most merciful God. Lord, you're the one who gives strength to the weak and rest to the weary. Lord, you give comfort to those who are sorrowful today. And you also are the Savior of the sinner today. Lord, you promise that you are a refuge to your children in every time of need. And so, Lord, we thank you for who you are. At the same time, Lord, we praise you for what you have done. Lord, we thank you for the cross, that you died for our sins. Not to hold them over us and to shame us, but to extend to us refreshment and forgiveness. God, we thank you for the power of the resurrection, for through it we know that it changes everything. It can change a skeptic into a servant. It can save, can save a mocker and turn him into a missionary. And so, Lord, we thank you for the, the power of the gospel that tells us of the good news of your death and your resurrection. And, Lord, may we live in that hope and in that peace this week in the worship and praise of your holy name. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Church, let's stand now. Let's sing to the only one who can offer us this hope and peace.
answers or calls me home here in the power of Christ we stand here in the power of Christ we stand Amen All glory be to King Jesus this morning and forevermore. If we have had the great privilege again this morning, church, to hear and to be reminded of the gospel, the good news that God loved this world so much and in such a way that he was willing to give his best in Christ, that Christ lived for us. He died in our place at the cross. He rose victoriously from the grave and it doesn't stop there because the gospel demands a response as we heard this morning because there truly are only two ways to live, to live for ourself or to live for Christ. To live for Christ means denying ourself. It means living a life of faith and repentance, trusting that he is who he says he was, that he is Lord and he is king of our life and repenting of our sin, turning from it and in turning from it, turning to Christ. And so if you've heard the gospel this morning, if you're not in Christ, you would say, I'm not a Christian. We've got some folks standing back at the Next Steps area that would love to have a conversation more about what that means. So go by there and just talk to them. Or if you came with someone this morning, talk to them about it over lunch today on the ride home, what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. The scriptures say that today is the day of salvation. And so don't linger another hour, another minute, certainly not another day. Today, put your faith and your hope in Christ. Partners of West Cabarrus Church, just a reminder to you this morning that we get the privilege again of worshiping Jesus through our giving. And so just a reminder, you can do that online. Uh, on the Church Center app or at the giving boxes in the Welcome Center or uh, the lobby. Well, as we've open up, opened up and uh, read and heard read the scriptures over us, I want to leave us with this this morning. Hebrews 13, 20 says this, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And we all said together, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter to you. Thanks for being with us.